By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So as we stroll through the hall of faith, which is what we've been doing the last few weeks, from Hebrews chapter 11, we notice the picture of the heroes of the Christian faith. In this hall, their pictures are displayed on the wall, and we especially note what made these people special, what made them unique, what distinguished these people from the rest of human history and their faith. Today, we pass the picture of a very elderly, worn, tattered, and tired man. A picture of somebody who, just from the surface, looks like they might be frail, maybe a little weak. Not what we would suspect to find in the hall of honor. And under this picture is inscribed the name of Noah. Everyone knows Noah. Even if this is your first time in the church, I'm guessing you've probably heard of Noah. This man was the firstborn of the 10th generation of humanity. Firstborn of the 10th generation. From his birth, Scripture promised that he would bring relief from the toils of hard work and from farming. And for 500 years, we are left to wonder how exactly Noah pulled this off. We are never told how he made life a little less heavy. But this was a big expectation of him, a heavy load to carry, and he gladly carried it his whole life, I would assume. When we catch up with him again, Noah is 500 years old. His skin is wrought with wrinkles. His eyes are made to strain. And every time he moves, every time he bends over, every time he walks, his body reminds him that it's old. I assume he spent most of his days alone, given the fact that Scripture tells us in Genesis 6 that the predominant culture had strayed further and further from God. And people were rebellious and self-serving. They were really utterly disrespectful of God and His ways. They were deep, deep in sin. Yet, Scripture tells us that Noah was a righteous man. And in God's eyes, get this, he was the only righteous man. In a world filled to the brim with wicked people, with wicked hearts, Noah was the only exception. Which reason would follow, he didn't have many friends. Imagine he sat alone, probably in the comfort of a slower pace of life that affords you after 500 years of hard work. He was probably comfortable in accomplishment, yet I'm guessing he was sick in his stomach and sick in his heart about the world around him. Maybe he had to fight off the onslaught of cynicism towards people who just couldn't get it. In a state of helpless prayer, I imagine that Noah heard a voice. And though his hearing was long gone, he didn't have to ask this voice to repeat itself because this voice skipped right over the ears and spoke directly to his heart. The clarity of the message was highlighted by the urgency of the matter. In Noah's heart, he heard God invite him to a project of hope. He heard God commission him to be a part of putting the whole world back together again. He heard God electing him for a moment of eternal significance. And isn't it just like God to roam the earth and find the person whose heart breaks for the same things his break for and to say, I choose you. I've called you. I've got a plan for you. The call sounds pretty flattering, doesn't it? Until you hear the details of the request. You see, Noah, at the retirement age of 500 and some, was being commissioned to build a luxury cruise liner (laughs) by hand, by himself. 
Oh yeah, we should, we should mention, Noah didn't live by water. He was landlocked. Noah hadn't ever experienced a flood. He maybe hadn't seen rain in a really long time. Yet, God in his grief, he is so sick in his heart of the rebellion and his disappointment in his beloved creation, he has decided to flood the whole earth and cleanse all of creation with fresh water. And Noah and his boat were to be the buoy of salvation for all creation. He was to be the only hope. Noah didn't have power tools or electric lifts, yet the blueprints called for 150 yards worth of deck, three stories tall. Can you believe it? What would people think of Noah? He was already weird. Nobody else was following the way of God, only him. He was already weird. Now, in landlocked desert, he begins to build a cruise liner. How would his body hold up? He's 500 years old. How could he muster that much strength and that much energy, the perseverance? This project would cost him everything. Everything. It would demand each waking moment that he has left and every single stockpiled resource that he had been preparing to be able to relax a little. And where would the motivation come from on day 3,520 when he's 10 years in and nobody has affirmed what he's doing? He's 10 years in, and he hasn't seen a drop of rain. He's 10 years in, full of blisters and calluses and aches and pain. How is he to keep going? I bet Noah rose from his knees. I bet he was infused with energy because he had just heard from God. Yet, I imagine a tear trickled down his cheek at the magnitude of the invitation and if he was anything like me, the best that he could muster in response to God's call might have been, God, I don't understand what you're talking about. I certainly can't see how you expect me to do this, but you have all of me today. And Hebrews 11.7 inscribes under his picture in the hall of faith, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. And he did just that, saving his family and saving your family. I suppose that is the point, right? That we always were and always will be saved by God's grace through human faith. For Noah, his faith was acting when he couldn't see. He had never seen a boat, and I doubt he could imagine what one looked like. He didn't have any reason to expect rain, and he couldn't imagine a flood. He didn't have the resources on hand to accomplish the project, and I can't imagine he knew where they would come from. He certainly couldn't see himself doing this alone, and couldn't imagine he'd find the strength to build for decades. But when Noah's sight failed him, his faith rescued him. He is the model of faith that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about when he said that faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. You see, some of us keep asking God for further confirmation, for further instruction. We keep asking God that He would show us the way, the plan, the resources. We keep asking God to tell us again what I think I heard you say before when really many of us need to begin asking for more faith to do what we've already been asked to do. Hebrews 11.7 continues, By faith Noah condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with the faith. And here's what that means to me. In other words, Noah was so confident that God had called him to this project, he was unafraid to draw a hard line in the sand between what it means to follow God and say yes in selfish rebellion. And since nobody else was willing to walk with God, Noah drew a line between himself and the rest of the world. 
In doing so, Noah isolated himself in holy assurance that God's way was worth following even when you must travel alone. You know the song, though none go with me, still I will follow. But how often is my faith deluded by the isolation I feel or the fear that sneaks up on me? You know, the peer pressure to fit in and not disrupt the way of our culture. You see, I would be obedient to what God's called me to do, but I wonder what other people will think of me if I, if I am. What will they say or what will they do? Or the question of rationalization that sneaks into our hearts that surely if God has called me to this, then other people will come around me and affirm me in it and, and join me in the partnership. That will be how I know that God has this plan for me. But Noah wasn't deterred by this self-inflicted pressure to fit in. He drew a line between what others would choose for themselves and what God had called him to do. And in great isolation, he said yes to God. So he's in the hall of faith. We celebrate him today, a, a, an act of faith that before he could see what God had called him to, he stepped out in faith and insecurity. Being alone, he said yes to God. Right out of school, I was 22 years old. I had been studying ministry at Mid-American Nazarene University, and I was blessed by God to link up with this church in Olathe, Kansas, the church called Living Hope, and, and I actually served there as the worship pastor and various other things for seven years under one of my great friends and, and greatest mentors to this day, the senior pastor, John Mara. And for seven years, he invested in me and we invested in that congregation. We poured our lives out in that church and we were really, really happy. We were really happy. It, it was a place that just felt like home to us. And seven years was a long time. So I was a little bit shocked when I got a call uh, from Chicago, Illinois, a church in Chicago, Illinois. See, when I grew up, I had a worship pastor when I was in high school. And this worship pastor kind of became my hero. He, he was such a gifted worship leader, and, and he took me under his wings and helped develop me as a musician and as a worship leader. And this worship pastor had moved from Nebraska to Chicago, Illinois, and he was serving on staff at this church. And when that church needed a worship pastor, my mentor and hero gave them my name. And so they called me on the phone, some stranger I'd never met, and said, hey, this is Pastor Brian. I wonder if you'd be interested in an opportunity in Chicago. Oh, not really, not really. Uh, the next day, that pastor hopped on an airplane and was sitting in front of me, and we were talking about ministry in Chicago. And as we went through the interview process, we began to feel like God was calling us, but we also felt this deep, deep agony and grief. Moments that it seemed right, but moments we couldn't imagine leaving our friends and our family who were close. We couldn't imagine what it would mean to go to a church, a different church, after we've invested so much in this one church. And my heart was sick. And I remember multiple times in the process wanting God just to break through and tell me what the right thing to do was because I couldn't sort out my emotions. And have you ever prayed these really honest prayers where you said, God, if you're calling me to this, then why are you so confusing? Let's be real for a moment. What are you even doing? I am perfectly happy seven years in ministry in this place, and now you've upset my heart, and I don't have clarity, and I don't know what to do. God, this isn't fair. What are you doing? This is the prayer I was praying. It was a prayer of agony. <laughs> you ever been honest with God? I had this little break, and I was in my office, little home office. We didn't have a building, and I was praying this prayer of agony, and 
I was frustrated. And I didn't do this often. I still don't do this often, but I got down on my knees like this. And I buried my head in my chair. And I said, God, I don't want to live like this. I'm so frustrated. What in the world are you doing? Like, would you just show me the way? I got this premonition in my spirit, and this doesn't happen often. Sometimes people tell stories like this often. I was, because I was down on my knees like this, hunched over, I had a bookshelf right here. And as I was just praying and thinking, I, I looked over and I felt God nudge me to grab this book. You see how big this book is? This book was sitting on my bottom shelf right here. This book was a gift that I was given in high school. I'd never opened it since high school, not that I remember. It was just something I carried with me. and It was sitting next to me like this, full of other books. I felt like God knocked on my heart and said, pick it up. And I felt so silly. You ever, you ever do things you think God's telling you? Sometimes they're not God. Sometimes you just have a weird feeling. I picked it up, and I was like, the unquenchable worshiper. I said, okay, God, you got me to pick it up. Where do you want me to start? Like, you know, sometimes God puts, like, page 67 in your head, right? God said, start at the beginning. So I opened it up, and on the very beginning there was this note. I didn't even know who wrote this note. I forgot I had this book. I had no idea where it came from. But God said start at the beginning. I started at the beginning. I opened it up and I saw this note. And here's a picture of it. It says, Brady, you have continued to surprise and amaze me as I've watched you grow spiritually these last few years. This is from high school. I'm excited about the new avenues God has opened up for us to work more closely, and I pray that God will continue to shape you into his very image as we try to be the worshipers he seeks. Signed, Brian Quaid, my worship mentor from Lincoln, who is now in Chicago. <laughs> Get this line I look forward to the new opportunities that God has opened up for us to work more closely together. <laughs> I was like, what in the world? So Carol Lee works nights. She had worked the night before. I ran upstairs and I woke her up. I, <laughs> I said, you know how God asks people to write stuff in the clouds? I said, God just wrote it to me in a book. He called me and he invited me into this next step with him. I knew from that moment that I have been invited by God. I knew he had opened up a way. And I couldn't still see, I couldn't imagine how it would work. If I'm honest with you, I was scared to death. How would I tell my boss and my mentor, who I loved more than anything, who we had co-labored for seven years? How would we leave our closest friends who journeyed with us through the early parts of marriage and family? How would Care Lee leave a job she loved, cherished her career at that hospital? Our family was close. This speaks to the isolation that Noah experienced because nobody really in our life thought this was a great idea. This was an idea that really upset a lot of people, that made a lot of people frustrated and discouraged. And the newness of Chicago, I, I had visited Chicago. I never really wanted to live there. So many unknowns, but I had been invited. And I hesitate to share this story for two reasons. One, it's nothing like the Noah story in the magnitude of his call. And two, Sometimes we hear stories like this and they're so 
such a fantasy world that we just write them off because it happens so rarely, so uncommon. And we forget that the power of stories, no, how, no matter how big or how grand they are, is that God desires for us to walk in faith even when we can't see what's ahead of us. Even when that walking in faith may be unpopular to the people around us, He's calling us to it. You see, we think we, we, we know that our lives are impacted, but these stories, we have to stop and notice something in these stories, and we have to notice something about Noah's story. Noah's invitation to build the ark, it didn't start, it didn't come to him out of the blue. Look at what it says about Noah in Genesis 6, before the whole ark narrative is even ever mentioned. Verse 9 says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. See, for 500 years, Noah walked with God. He was in step. He was in cadence. Actually, if you look at the original language here, it almost talks about a choreography when two people are moving together. This was Noah's experience with God. He was walking with God. When God moved, he moved. When God swayed, he swayed. When God sped up, he sped up. When God slowed down, he slowed down. Noah walked faithfully with God. Have you ever tried walking with someone? Maybe a three-legged race where they tie your, your inside leg together and you have to walk with a friend. Walking with other people takes effort and intention. It's focused energy and the submission of your will. Every morning I walk Brigham to school. Brigham is my five-year-old boy. He's really short, too. <laughs> and he has these little legs. And something you should know about me is I, I am horrible at waiting on people. So this is how we walk to school. I start out way ahead of him. Then he runs, catches up. <laughs> then he catches up. He starts walking again. I go ahead of him. Then he starts running, catches up to me back again. And all the way to school, we're hardly ever side by side. Because I haven't submitted my will to go fast, to be willing to walk with my son. I've, I've put him off rhythm. We're out of sync. We're not in step. We're not journeying together. Church, are you walking with God? Are you keeping step with His Spirit that's inside of you? Are you getting ahead? Or maybe you're lagging way behind. Or maybe if you're like me, you're just tired of choosing somebody else's pace. You want your own. You see, when Noah heard God's crazy request to build this giant boat, he was familiar with God's voice. He had been walking right next to him. And one of the greatest disciplines of the Christian faith is to cultivate a heart that is sensitive and responsive to the inner voice of God. To go slow enough to hear it. To have courage enough to test it out. To have faith enough to obey it. Isn't it cool that my story about moving to Chicago, God used my personal walk with him from 12 or 13 years earlier in my life. This note says, you have continued to surprise and amaze me as I've watched you grow spiritually. In other words, he was saying, I've seen you walk with God. What if God can use Decades long of walking with him to speak clear direction to you in your time of need. Will you be in step and able to hear the call? Will you be sensitive enough to recognize that voice inside of you? Will you be experienced enough? You've tested that voice of faith enough that you can say yes with confidence. 
Because here's what I know. God is not just calling Noah. And God is not just calling your pastor. God's calling you. And as I've preached today, some of you in this room have felt God's finger on a certain calling that He's placed in your life that you've been waiting for more confirmation, more affirmation. You've been in the middle of a prayer of agony on your knees and you feel God press that place and say, this is my voice. Step out in faith. As I've preached, others of you have felt a quickening of your heart, this invitation to just trust God more in general to rely upon his faithfulness. And others of you are hearing this really simple invitation to get in step with God, to find his rhythm, to find his pace. As Linda comes, let me ask you, what if God is calling you to build an ark? No, I, I doubt he's calling you to build a boat. But what if he's calling you to build a bit of protection and respite from the chaos of a world that's bent on selfishness and idolatry? What if you're being called to create spaces of grace and forgiveness and redemption? What if God is looking for people in step with him so that he can point you to the ultimate wood and rescue, the ultimate salvation of the world, the cross of Jesus? Are we willing to draw the line between us and the rest of the world? Are we willing to step out in faith when no one else sees the vision? Can we go before we see? Are you ready to stop hedging your bets. You see, some of us have been called to build an ark and we're over there blowing up a rubber raft. We don't want to be caught off guard in case God was right, but we're not sure we have the courage to trust him fully with everything within us. And so we've hedged our bets and settled in. God's not calling you to build a raft. He's calling you for faith. Step in confidence. Because Noah isn't the only ark builder. I believe that. This story is told like it's told because it points to a future reality. And you and me have been called to partner with God to build places of rescue and respite in the world. So will we hear the invitation to participate by faith? you bow your heads with me. God, I know you're speaking to somebody today. And they've been wrestling with you, not because they're rebellious, but because, God, sometimes we struggle to understand. So God, would you nudge them in your spirit? Would you nudge them in their heart? Would you point to the truth of what you're calling them to? Would you give them courage that comes by grace to step into all that you have? And God, there's somebody here today who's listening to me. And as I talked about walking with my son to school, they said, that's my walk with the Lord. God, would you call them unto yourself would you make a new invitation? Would you make your rhythm really clear and easy to follow? Or don't leave us as we are. We desire to walk faithfully with our God. Lord, this is a moment in time in this church building now. You've called us to this point to affirm and confirm in us that you have called us to something significant. Would you help us to say yes today? Would you help us to say yes?
or it's for your glory, we say yes. It's because worse than, worse than missing out on all this life has to offer, worse than giving up everything we have to chase something that really maybe wasn't your voice, worse than all of that, God, is that we might miss out on what you invited us into. A life of significance walking with you. Make us like Noah, we pray. In your name, amen. So we talk about our weekly exercises during the series, and these are just things for you to get a handle on what we've discussed and explored today. And so here's your weekly exercise. If you want to get your cell phone out and take a picture of this, or if you want to jot down some notes, or make a mental note if you're better than I am. But here's the weekly exercise. Get in step with God. So for some of us, that's to slow down. And to slow down, maybe we need to cancel something that's already on our calendar. Maybe we need to say no to something so that we can find the gate of God. Or maybe we need to block out some time. Just put it on your calendar. You ever set up meetings in your phone? What if you set up a meeting to walk with the Lord? You don't have to do a devotion or read your Bible. What if you just sat and listened to his voice? Some of us need to speed up. Maybe you need to join a group. Maybe you need to step into new territory. Maybe you need to do something you've been unwilling to do to this point, to express your faith, to serve on a team, to cross the street, talk to a neighbor to attend church. Some of us must speed up. And then others of us, we just need to have these honest prayers of agonies like I had in my office that day where we cry out to God and say, God, I don't get it, but I'm coming to you anyways. In my frustration, I'm coming to you. I'm bringing you everything I have. This is yours. So get in step. The other thing is what if we Some of us took a step this week to obey and to risk. And what I would challenge you to do, if you feel God placing something in your life, start small. Start with the one thing that has zero excuses. Eliminate all the excuses and just take one step forward. And as you do, God will be faithful in that next step. Don't think about the end product. Don't imagine the end of the ark. Just grab an axe and go cut down a tree. See what God does as you do it. And then others of us, we need to move forward before we know the end result. Maybe we're spending too much time in prayer asking God to show us exactly what the path would look like when he's saying, do you forget I'm with you? I'll get you there. I'll get you there. Let's take a step of faith before we know the ending. You glad you came to church today? Would you stand to your feet? I am glad you came today too. I can't wait to see how the story of Noah infuses your faith today as we flex our faith muscles. There's nothing arrogant about that. Let's flex our faith muscles this week as we step into our calling. Let's sing our benediction song today. We sing hallelujah, your kingdom. As we go in your name, we shout and we proclaim, let your will be done in us. Love you. Have a good week.